So this week I was down in my basement and I came across something called a terrible towel. Have you ever heard of this? These terrible towels originated in Pittsburgh and it's basically a small hand towel sized towel with something printed on it that originated with the Pittsburgh Steelers to show everybody else how much they hate them. And that's really the, the, the gist of it. But the terrible towel that I had, and I didn't bring it into the auditorium tonight. I thought it'd be sacrilegious. It had the Detroit Lions on it, and I didn't want to do anything that would disgrace the Lord. And I'm being facetious a little bit, but 2009 Thanksgiving game between the Packers and the Detroit Lions. And uh, it's a terrible towel. I have it down in my basement. And I came across that and started thinking about that. Remembering that the, this idea of a towel is mentioned in scripture. Somebody has a cup of coffee and it's driving me crazy. Who has the coffee? I can smell that. Praise the Lord. Not that I'm an addict, okay? I can smell that coffee up here as if it were right here. So I hope you enjoy that. And uh, it's your fault. You distracted me. That towel represents something. When I said terrible towel, and I knew that it would happen, Brother Jamie started to chuckle because he's thinking about his team. And that towel, it's just a piece of cloth, but it represents something. Notice in the book of John, chapter 13, and verse number 2, And supper being ended, the devil had now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. And the him there is Jesus. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper. And we're going to talk about this in just a moment, but I want to say it right now. When you know who you are as a person, when you understand what God has made you to be. That's going to be the platform for you to be able to have humility. Whenever you find somebody who's a very uh, pride-filled person, who lacks humility, who's very braggadocious, generally the seed of that in their heart is that they are very insecure. And so they have to behave in such a way where they demonstrate superiority over other people and they desire to have that praise of men. They desire for other people to notice them or to laud them for who they are. But friend, I want you to know tonight that you are somebody in the body of Christ. Jesus loved you so much, you individually. He loved you so much that he died for you. Think of the high value that puts on you. Then if you look in the book of Psalms in 139 and you understand the magnificence of creation that God invested into you. The Bible said when we were yet unable to see you being formed in the womb. Of course now we cheat with 3D uh, ultrasounds. But when God was putting all that together. He was designing and crafting that and making it a masterpiece. And that's you. And when you understand that, that allows you to be secure within yourself. And that gives the platform for you to be able to have humility to go with what we're going to talk about tonight. You say, Pastor, why are you injecting this into, we're going to talk about a towel? I don't want you to see it. And supper being ended, the devil now putting into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, read this next statement with me to the comma, and that he was come from God. Jesus was confident in who he was. In the book of Philippians, which we'll read in a moment, Jesus said that he knew he was God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But knowing that, he was able to humble himself. And if you struggle, if you find in your life that you struggle with 
other people's opinions of you, I think really the fix for you is to really study and understand biblically how God views you. And realize that you are accepted in the beloved. God loves you. God accepts you. Warts and all. When I accept God's acceptance of me, that's faith. When I can accept myself, then I can accept other people. I can have mercy and compassion on other people when I realize that God loves that individual just as much as God loves me. And I hope you really see that here. Jesus knew who he was. And that he was come from God and went to God. He riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a, what's the next word? Towel. What did he do with it? He girded himself. He put it around his midsection. After that he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Heavenly Father, help us as we see this. Help us to understand the importance of what we talk about tonight in your name. Amen. Only two times in the scripture do we find the word towel. It's in our text, John 13, verses 4 and 5. It's not mentioned often. The usage here is tied with a lesson that Jesus is trying to give to the disciples. It's mentioned for us, recorded in the Gospel of John, because God, in the flesh, wants to perpetuate this lesson so that we understand it. If you are a follower of Jesus, then the lesson tonight is for you. The lesson is on the duty of the believer to be involved in ministering to others. God did not make us to sit, soak, and sour in church. God made us to minister to other people. That is in the DNA of a believer. When you got saved, you became a new creation, a new creature in Christ Jesus. And part of that new creation that you are, that Christ in you, part of that is that you are a minister. The Bible tells us very plainly in the book of 2 Peter that he left us an example that we should follow in his steps. Then it says in another place where Jesus in the gospel said, the Son of Man did not come to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. We can't escape the clear lesson that the Lord is giving us here. That we have a duty to be involved in ministering to other people. The example of Jesus and his earthly ministry is characterized by ministry, yes, but his life of ministering to other people. And I wonder if sometimes ministering to other people is just a little bit too personal or a little bit too close. And sometimes we want areas, and I know this because I'm an introvert, we want areas of ministry that don't involve contact with people. I mean, the big move is contactless. And us uh, introverts said, yay, you know, 2020 was like, woo, banner year if you're an introvert. But the truth is God made us as believers, is part of your DNA to minister to other people. This extends to your family, but more than just your family. It extends to your church family, but beyond your church family. And I think that our church family is very special to me for many reasons, but the eagerness of so many here at church to serve and to minister makes being a pastor here such a joy but also understanding that it's not just my responsibility to pastor, but it's my responsibility to minister to other people. That's one of the reasons why I serve in the choir, and Brother Drew has to put up with me in the choir as a thorn. But that's part of me ministering to other people. Nobody pays me to sing in the choir. 
And somebody asked me once, many years ago, just as a challenge, what things do you do as a pastor that you don't get paid to do? That's your ministry. Thank God for believers who have a towel and know how to use it. So the question tonight is, are you actively involved in ministering to other people? If I asked you to write down a list from the last week of people that you personally ministered to. The meal here that is depicted, and we're going to notice first of all the exhibition of what Jesus did, how he showed it. The meal was one of fellowship and love. Here's Jesus, he's with his disciples, and we know that he had spent almost three and a half years his earthly ministry with the disciples. He's the one that he called them to be with him, and they were with him. And so now this is coming to a close, and it'll be the last time that Jesus in a physical, personal sense, is going to be gathered together with all of the disciples in this room together. And we know this uh, function here as being the Last Supper. And that's coming here quick, very soon. The Last Supper is going to come on. But that he is sitting together. He's enjoying the company of all the disciples. And they are enjoying fellowship on a way that they never will after he leaves. Somebody's immortalized this time together they called it the last supper and they made a painting about it notice verse number 25 just as reference then he lying on Jesus's breast said Lord who is it so here we have this picture they're all having a meal together now this wasn't just a quick lunch stop and go uh, the way we do sometimes it wasn't a meal on the run the way I know many of you men have to do I mean, you're driving to the next job and you're wolfing down your sandwich as quick as you can uh, because you know if you can not take time out for lunch and just keep working, you hope to get home a little sooner, and I understand that. But this was one of more of a leisure meal where everybody's laid out on couches. That was the habit. And these Middle Eastern dinners are a big deal and very elaborate with many courses during this time of history, it was said that the Romans would have meals. They would lay out on couches. And the meals sometimes were as many as 22 courses. I'm thinking, wow. And people would go out in the garden and get rid of some food and then come back. They just would. That's what they would do. So here's the disciples. No doubt that Jesus would have loved to sit and continue the fellowship. But the Bible tells us in verse number 4. Let's read to the comma, starting with he. He riseth from supper. Jesus leaves the table, the leisure of the table. He leaves the food. He leaves the comfort of the couch, the fellowship, and it's not time to eat anymore. It's not time to fellowship anymore. It's time for Jesus to serve. There is a time for leisure. There is a time to be relaxed. There is a time to get busy. I got a little cat nap in this afternoon and there's something about Sunday afternoon naps that are just really sweet. I don't know why, but I squeezed the little one in after tender care today. But there's a time to serve, a time to work, a time to labor, a time to roll up your sleeves, a time to get busy. Jesus set the example. He laid down his napkin and he picked up his towel. He laid down his fork and spoon and he picked up his towel. He left the plate, the food, the fun, the fellowship, and he went to work. The Bible said also that he laid down his robe. And you and I both know this, and uh, I'm not very good at this, and I get scolded often for it. But there is a difference between work clothes and church clothes. And my wife says, I don't know the difference between the two. She says, uh, look at this, you're going to have ruined another shirt or ruined another pair of pants. But he took off his outer robe. And he's girded the towel, now he's in his ministry clothes. Notice that he not only 
laid aside his robe, but he lowered his reputation. Philippians 2 verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. To come in the form of a servant was made in likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. This is just symbolic of what Jesus is going to do as a servant for everybody. Jesus was not too high and mighty to get his hands dirty. The job of a servant in a home, normally it was a slave or a paid servant that would do the feet washing. People wore open sandals, it was very hot in this part of the world. The roads were not paved. There wasn't necessarily sidewalks. And so their feet would get dusty. If you've worn sandals or flip-flops or something like that for any length of time during the summer uh, on sand or dirt, what happens after a while is you develop a little mud on the bottom of your feet. Have you noticed that? Your feet sweat a little bit and uh, you take your you take your sandals off or your Crocs off and you look underneath and oh my goodness, there's mud, there's paste on the bottom of my feet. So the servant would take a little basin of water and he'd pour that water on their feet and it was so refreshing. I know when I was hiking several times, I'd come to a stream and I took my shoes off and my wool socks off and put my feet inside the water and that cool water just felt so good on my feet and rinsed them off. The very most menial task was pouring water in a basin and washing feet of other people. And so menial that even with servants, there was kind of a tier of servants and it was the lowest on the totem pole that did the feet washing. You see the picture here? Jesus is doing the most menial, the most undesirable and I hate to say it, but sometimes in a church setting or even in a work setting, when assignments are being handed out, some people say, not me. I don't do that. I don't do that. I remember one time it was vacation Bible school and we had brought uh, some individuals in and a young man come in and he had made a mess of himself. He just had trouble controlling his bodily functions. Somebody was needed to help him out and the aftermath. And I remember doing that cleanup job and I felt so bad for him. He said, did it bother you? It was, it was bad. But what bothered me more than that is just how embarrassed he was at the whole thing. There are some tasks that are just very undesirable. There really are. Here's the explanation that Jesus gives, verse number 12. We saw the exhibition of it. Jesus did it. But then the explanation is, so after he had washed their feet and taken, and taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you not for you, to you. Everything Jesus did during his three and a half years of ministry was an object lesson and a purposeful lesson that Jesus was doing. Jesus was preparing the disciples for ministry. He knew that there were many things that they needed to know. Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, read with me aloud to the end of the verse, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. Now, I'm not going to get caught up a great deal into feet washing, and I'm never going to discredit somebody or make fun of somebody if this is the habit of what they do 
in their church ministry. I have been to several church ministries where they are literally in the habit of uh, the pastor will have the deacons come up and once a year he'll wash their feet publicly. And, uh, and I've seen that done before. And uh, one time many years ago, somebody did that here at church. And I'll be honest, I was a little uncomfortable with the whole thing. I don't have stinky feet or anything like that, but it was just different. But I appreciated the, the lesson and why it was done. I think the greater lesson is not just the physically washing of feet, although the washing of feet was done here and Jesus was emphasizing it. Uh, how many of you, just be real honest, and I'm not going to poke on you for your answer. I just, I just want to see where we're at here. How many of you honestly cannot stand touching somebody else's feet? I mean, that's just kind of a problem, okay? And there's a few of you. Now, honest question again. How many of you enjoyed your feet like being rubbed? You like it, okay? A number of you do. How many of you would say, you know what? Don't touch my feet. Leave me alone. And uh, my hand's up. Thank you, Brooke. That's me too. And uh, my mother-in-law, the same. Some people, they're just, you know, give me a hug, but don't touch my feet. And that's okay. So what Jesus was doing is Jesus is teaching a lesson on the importance of serving. That's the explanation. Jesus is explaining the example. Notice verse number 16. Verily, verily, it's being emphasized of a truth of a truth, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that is sent greater than he that hath sent him. If ye know these things, what's the next word? Happy. We have a wrong idea that if we have enough money or if we have enough seniority, we'll never have to do the kinds of things that we don't want to do. We will make somebody else do them or we will pay somebody else to do it and we won't have to do it. And I, this is not the same for everybody, but I want you to think of a list of things that for you are undesirable things. And it may be some of those things may be areas of service that you could try sometimes. Say, you know, I'm going to do this as a point of service. I don't like doing it, but I want to do it purposefully because this is an area where I struggle and I want to do this as a point of service. Uh, some of you, uh, to change a diaper, you'd rather have a root canal than change a diaper. And uh, maybe you ought to experience that once or twice. <laughs> But Jesus gives the key to the disciples. He said, you're not happy when you're not doing the things you don't like to do. He said, you're going to be happiest when you're serving other people. And that really is the key. The book of Luke chapter number 7, I'll read it for you. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Brother Gary mentioned this this afternoon. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. Now, we'll be honest, in our culture, when we read that, that makes some of us uncomfortable. And I promise you, if some woman comes up here, takes my shoes off, and starts kissing my feet, I'm going to get really uncomfortable really fast. But Jesus said, Peter, you're not liking what this lady's doing. And you're just kind of, ew. What's she doing? But I said, you didn't extend that basic hospitality to me. You see that? He was saying, Peter, this lady, she's a servant. She's a servant. Jesus did not chide the lady. He commended her. So if he learned it, he came in expecting someone to give him water for his feet, but nobody did. 
Jesus came in expecting a kiss, but nobody did. Jesus came in expecting somebody to anoint his head with oil, but nobody did. And when somebody did, everybody got critical. And that happens sometimes in a church setting. Well, I know why he's doing that. I know why she's doing that. Maybe you don't. Maybe you don't. Maybe it's just an act of service on their part because they love the Lord. What's the expectation of service? Jesus makes no bones about it. The expectation is, verse 15, For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. I want you to make this a matter of prayer individually. I'm not going to ask you to make a decision tonight because sometimes we don't have enough time to think or pray on something. But I want you to maybe to write a little note to yourself, even if you got to take one of the offering envelopes and uh, write a note on the back of it or your bulletin. Just write on the back of it. And ask the Lord to show you a way or ways that you can serve others. Jesus was talking about the disciples serving one another. And it says in the scriptures, by love, serve one another. Boy, that would fix some things at home, wouldn't it? We'd never have a lady fussing about how her husband never helps at home. If we learn by love, serve one another. We would never have really an empty spot anywhere. And we certainly would have a lot less critical spirits and much more happier spirits if we would learn this valuable lesson that Jesus taught the disciples. Do you have a towel?